today's program is very, very timely. Um, Brazil is one of the world's most populous countries with one of its largest GDPs and is, is in the midst of multiple crises. Surrounding its controversial right-wing president, Jair Bolsonaro, who is often referred to as Brazil's Donald Trump, there is much uncertainty about the future of the democratic institutions in that country. A second crisis is that Brazil is second only to the United States in facing the rapidly growing ravages of COVID-19. Also growing from the political and health threats are economic issues. Today, we will join a conversation with two eminently experienced authorities on Brazil today. Dr. Robert Mugga is the co-director of, of the Irape Igarape Institute, one of Latin America's most highly regarded think tanks in the areas of violence, social change, and development. The institution has more than 20 partners and affiliates around Latin America and the world. He earned his PhD from Oxford University and has presented several TED Talks. He joins us for Canada, from Canada, where he just chaired a virtual two-day international conference for Wilton Hall, a Great Britain organization with a long history of promoting international understanding in multiple areas. The simple objective of that conference of the last two days was to explore ways the international community could cut world violence by half by 2030. With Rob, and we'll be speaking second, is Andres Schiapani, the Brazil correspondent of the Financial Times of London. It's the Times is the world's most read financial periodical. He joins us from Brazil, where he is in his last week of this assignment. He will be moving to East Africa as the Financial Times correspondent for that region in the future. We may be keeping him away from a going away party, I, I don't know. But I think by talking to us in Colorado, he probably has warm memories from a couple decades back when he was a, snee, a ski and snowboard instructor in Aspen. He's a native of Argentina and was a world-class skier himself uh, in Argentina. So first I'm gonna turn it over to Rob uh, to give us kind of an overview and then he will take, turn it over to Andres. Thank you, Rob. I certainly am eager to hear what you have to say. Great, M many thanks, Deb, uh, Joe, and of course to the uh, Colorado Foothills World Affairs Council for, for this really um, generous invitation for us to speak. Uh, and this, uh, it goes without saying, is a distinctly futuristic uh, 21st century kind of experience we're all having here. Um, here we are digitally connected between Boulder, uh, Canada, Sao Paulo, uh, to review the fate of Brazil. Uh, and we're here to discuss, appropriately enough, uh, the country that's known as the country of the future, uh, that always will be the country of the future. Um, let me just start my intervention with an, an admission and a caveat. Um, and the admission is that, uh, as is patently obvious, neither, neither of us, Andres or me, are Brazilian. Uh, we both call Brazil home, or at least we have been calling Brazil home, and I happen to have married into Brazil, uh, but we're not Canadian. So take that admission with uh, a grain of salt. The second caveat is, is that Andres is Argentinian, uh, who as all of you know, are uh, natural rivals of uh, their Portuguese speaking uh, neighbor. And despite his scrupulous adherence to the facts and commitment to objectivity, an Argentinian he always will be. So you've been warned, uh, that's your second grain of salt. Um, but before we launch into Brazil's contemporary challenges, uh, this triple crisis, uh, as you described it, Joe, I thought it might be useful to refresh our memories about the country itself, and just to go a little bit deeper into the past. Um, for one, uh, the really key point is that there are a lot of Brazilians. This is a huge country, about 210 million of them at last count. And I think the new census actually comes out this year, which makes Brazil the sixth most populous country on the planet. Uh, the second point is the country's GDP is sizable. It's about 1.8 trillion, making it the ninth largest economy in the world. It kind of goes up and down depending on the currency and exchange rates. Uh, and it's down from about fifth largest uh, about a decade ago. Uh, and people often forget the sheer geographic dimensions of Brazil. This is a continent-sized place spanning 8.5 million square kilometers. That's 3.2 million square miles. Only slightly smaller than the United States and Canada and about the same size as Western Europe combined. 
Uh, and the statistics go on and on. It, it's not just amongst the world's largest countries in terms of population or GDP or geography. It's also an environmental uh, behemoth. Brazil is home to 40% of the world's tropical forests, 20% of its freshwater supply, 10% of its biodiversity. Uh, so this is a huge and consequential place. And so why, in spite of an abundance of riches, did Charles de Gaulle supposedly complain uh, that this was not a serious country? Uh, well, the answer, as with so much in life, has to do with lobsters. Uh, more specifically, de Gaulle's derisive comment can be traced to dispute between Brazil and France in the early 1960s, where they nearly came to blows over fishing, or more precisely, the way to fish, lobster. And although no shots were fired, the conflagration is now known perhaps a little extravagantly as the Battle of Iterare. And the story goes, just as a little non sequitur, de Gaulle was furious with a savvy Brazilian diplomat, Carlos Alves de Souza Filho. And for any of you who've ever worked with Brazil's famously skilled foreign service, uh, you know why de Gaulle might have felt so darn frustrated. But back to the question at hand, why has Brazil struggled to live up to the potential of its national motto, which is ordem e pro progresso, order and progress, ever since its independence in 1822. Virtually everyone who has lived in Brazil, and I'm sure Andres and I will agree on this, solemnly believes uh, that Brazil has yet for a variety of reasons to live up to what the philosopher Auguste Comte's uh, Ode to Positive and described is l'amour pour, pour principe et l'ordre pour base, le progrès pour but, which means love is principle and order is the basis, progress as the goal. For decades, Brazil has been known to outsiders as a kind of alluring paradise of unspoilt wilderness, a place of carefree indolence and sensuality, of cordiality and racial harmony. But the truth is that that image has been shattered in recent decades by the devastation of the Amazon, eye-watering inequality that puts about 90% of the country's wealth in the hands of 10% of the population, extreme racism uh, against the 50% of the population who are Afro-Brazilian descendants, breathtaking corruption, and skyrocketing criminal violence and impunity. The truth is that these and other challenges that I've just mentioned have always been in Brazil, despite this reputation as this indolent paradise. Ruinous political leadership, economic mismanagement, and now COVID-19 are just bringing a lot of these issues into much sharper relief uh, than before. One of the most insightful books about Brazil, and I recommend everyone on this call if they got a chance to read it, is called The Brazilians by the American law professor Joseph Page. And he claims, like others, he's not alone in saying this, that the seas to Brazil's underachievement were laid down about 200 years ago. Brazil was the only territory in the New World to have been both the seat of empire and a colony at the same time. Brazil was also the last country in the West, and this is really important, to abandon slavery in 1888. I suspect many in this call may know that, which goes some way, I think, to explaining its deeply entrenched class structure. So let's just dwell, given that it's such a prominent issue also in the American uh, mood right now, on this question of race and racism in Brazil, because I think this is fundamental in understanding our, cont our, our contemporary challenge. During the Atlantic slave trade between 1500 and 1866, Close to 5 million slaves, the numbers are disputed, could be 4.9, could be 5, 5 million slaves were brought from Africa to Brazil. Compare this to the roughly 300,000 slaves, about 5% of the global cumulative total who went to the United States. Yet for most of Brazil's independent history, the race question has been pretty much glossed over. For years, scholars have described Brazil uh, as a kind of racial democracy made up of citizens living in a racial harmony. And a narrative emerged, one strongly supported by the country's political and economic elite, this bare, narrow bandwidth of elite, that somehow Brazil had escaped the trials and tribulations of racism uh, and racial discrimination. This idea of racial democracy, this idea of the harmonious racial milieu, can be traced back to a Brazilian sociologist named G Gilberto Ferreri in the 1930s. And he suggested that Portugal's benign imperialism its close relationships between masters and slaves, the act of mingling of the races led inevitably to a meta-race, a kind of post-racial society. And this perception that Brazil had somehow avoided racial acrimony and tension was really a source of pride for many citizens in Brazil. Indeed, many Brazilophiles globally around the world and th throughout the 20th century 
the government routinely contrasted its lack of race animosity favorably to what was happening in, say, the United States before and during uh, the civil rights movement. This wasn't just a domestic play to, in a way, satiate the base or satiate the masses. It played also into Brazil's wider posture globally as a champion of the disenfranchised, a voice of the global south, you know, the countries of the developing world, as an anti-imperialist power during the period of decolonization, and as a kingmaker of the non-aligned movement, the N77. So as you might expect, and I've somewhat romanticized this, but many of these somewhat romanticized ideas have come under scrutiny since the late 1970s, and especially in the last decade. Uh, the revised interpretation is that Brazil's so-called racial democracy was loudly championed by predominantly white elite to obscure a, a very real, very violent racial oppression. And a great many, I would argue, Brazil's contemporary challenges today, whether it's inequality or exclusion or impunity or the work that I do on violence, they're very strongly connected to this somewhat unexamined legacy of racial discrimination and structural inequality. And in spite of comparatively recent efforts to try to reduce this discrimination in Brazil, it's deeply woven into the fabric of the country's electoral politics, its education systems, its labor markets, and everything in between. And it's sustained by the country's power elite, many of whom are were memorably described in Alex Quadros's uh, Brazilianaires, uh, a book entitled Wealth, Power, Decadence, and Hope in an American Country. Brazil's elitism and patronage are legendary. And this has contributed to what I think I can describe, Andres has to be more restrained, but mind-boggling levels of corruption and impunity. Most oh, of you right. on this call may be familiar with a, a, a very famous uh, uh, scandal called Lava Jato or Car Wash, which started in 2014, captured global headlines, and ensnared dozens of former presidents and ministers and politicians and CEOs uh, and others across Brazil and a dozen Latin American countries. This started out as a small investigation into a money laundering uh, allegation, with, which metastasized into a sprawling corruption scandal at the, at the country's state oil company called Petrobras. All told, it siphoned anything in the order of two to $13 billion from the public purse. This is one of the biggest corruption schemes in history, not just in Brazil's history, but in global, in recorded history. It's even got its own Netflix series uh, called The Mechanism, and that's the ultimate measure of achievement. So, but Lava Jato is just the latest iteration of a long story, because before Car Wash, before Lava Jato, there was Mensalão, the big money scheme, which involved cash for votes and was discovered in 2005. And before Mensalão, there was Benastado scandal between 1991 and 2002, which involved hundreds of millions lost to money laundering, and so on and so on. So the good news is, is that awareness about these issues, about racial injustice, about deep inequality, about corruption, it's increasingly widespread. And there's a growing, I would argue, intolerance now in Brazil with this status quo. Until recently, it was inconceivable to imagine a Black Lives Matter protest marching up Sao Paulo's principal boulevard. Uh, or it was impossible to imagine that business titans of companies like Oldebrecht or OAS or EBX or senior members of Congress would be sent to the, the slammer and stay there. But it's going to take a generation or more to reverse what are deeply entrenched norms in Brazil. I mean, collective memory projects and genealogical ancestry tracing and the rise of progressive black consciousness movements, these are all steps in the right movements, but they're just steps. Now, Andres may disagree, and this could be an interesting point of conversation, but I, I think that many of the convulsions we're witnessing in Brazil over the last couple of years, notably the impeachment of President Dilma, the collapse of the Temer administration, the rise of the reactionary ultra-right political movements and its noxious leader, Jair Bolsonaro, are not only due to collapsing commodity prices or bad governance or disgust with the left, but also a reaction to this racial awakening and progressive policy moves that were deliberately intended to upend this, uh, this older order. Big pro-poor moves by the Workers' Party, um, which had a 13-year tenure. Moves like conditional cash transfer programs called the Bolsa Familia, or subsidized housing called Minha Casa, or quota systems for education, or cultural projects. These empowered an underclass, but were pretty much derided by the elite. Uh, and today, Brazilians on all sides of this are last seven years than during the entire dictatorship of 1964 to 1985. So what we're seeing is an entire generation being immersed in a new kind of politics. Now, all of this probably sounds very familiar to those of you uh, in the United States and not without good reason. I mean, 
both Brazil and the US are continental in size and attitude. Both were once slave societies. Both are immigrant nations that celebrate their frontier origins despite uh, a deep, I would say, historical amnesia uh, and long traditions of racism. In the US, this sort of self-absorption has contributed to a kind of exceptionalism. And in Brazil, I think one could argue it's contributed to a sense of disillusionment. So let me pivot to the next part of my presentation, which is where are we today? And Andreas is gonna take us to where we're gonna go. Um, He's got the, the hardest part. Uh, Andres and I both agree that Brazil, and Joe, obviously, that the Brazil is facing three interlocking crises and a tremendous level of uncertainty about what happens next. These include the COVID-19 pandemic, which is still very much in its first wave. They include the economic crisis, which is long-term consequences, which I think we're only starting to understand. And they include the political security crisis that I, I could threaten stability in, 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 in Brazil and possibly the region. And there's a fourth crisis, which we're not going to talk about, but which has implications for all of us. And this is the Amazon uh, deforestation and degradation. As most of you know, land clearances in the Amazon are rampant. Uh, about 90% of all deforestation that's happening in the Amazon is illegal. Uh, some say it could be as high as 99%. Um, and we're seeing levels of deforestation right now in the Amazon that are higher than anything we've seen in the last 15 years. And this is really important. And I'm not going to talk about it today. We can talk about it in the, the Q&A. But the best scientific estimates predict that if 20 to 25% of the primary growth of the Amazon is cut down, this could trigger an irreversible, what's called a die off, turning the world's largest tropical forest, 40% of the world's forest, tropical forest, into the world's largest savanna, uh, with huge ecological uh, knock on effects, not just in Latin America, but globally. And we're about one to 2% away from this tipping point. That's the best guess right now. So we're at a very, very dangerous moment here in the Amazon. Uh, Andres and I actually were part of it. Well, in fact, Andres led a short documentary uh, about this with the Financial Times, which we can share later. Um, it's a short 15 minute documentary about what's going on in the region. So let me just walk through these three crises very quickly. The first is the health crisis. So how bad is it? Andres might put up a, a slide for it in a moment, but Brazil documented its first case comparatively late on the 26th of February. And it was believed to be a Brazilian who was returning from the Lombardy uh, region of Italy. Another cluster of infections reportedly came from someone who coincidentally had traveled to Aspen uh, in early March. The initial reaction was slow, but more or less on the right course in the first couple of weeks, because Brazil actually has a pretty progressive health system. The government shut down some airports, it imposed a few quarantines, it encouraged people to stay home, but things unraveled very, very quickly. And a big reason for this was the country's leader, Jair Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro, who as Joe mentioned, is likened or known as the tropical Trump, was against the lockdowns pretty much from the beginning, since he feared it would negatively affect the economy and therefore his popularity. He played down and then politicized the evidence. He advertised fake remedies like chloroquine. He fired his health ministers. He flagrantly ignored his own government's health advice. I mean, I'm sure this is sounding very, very familiar to everybody on the line. And the results were tragically uh, predictable. Brazil today is just behind the United States with about 2.6 million confirmed infections. And it just passed the 90,000 death threshold, uh, I think in the last 48 hours. Researchers say that the numbers, researchers from the Institute for Tropical Met uh, for Health Metrics uh, out in the West Coast, as well as uh, researchers at the UCL in London, say that the real numbers could be 10 to 15 times higher than this. Uh, the, the disease shows no sign of letting up. Epidemiologists say the numbers could rise uh, above 1.1 million by 2021. Uh, and part of the problem is that Brazil has an aging population. People think of Brazil as a young uh, population, but actually it's getting quite old. But the truth is, is that most people contracting the disease and who are dying are poor, they're vulnerable, and they're black, overwhelmingly. Now, Brazil also has a decent healthcare system, and this is maybe the one silver lining. It's got about 55,000 treatment centers, 300,000 doctors, uh, nurses, and care professionals, and this is a legacy of, of previous governments, but the situation is precarious. Hospitals across the country are overwhelmed, especially in the northern uh, regions, um, and you may have heard about hospitals in the Amazon region having literally coming close to collapse, if not collapsing. The recovery rate, it turns out, is about 50% higher in private institutions as compared to public ones. Uh, but it is worth noting that more Brazilian nurses have died of COVID-19 than of any other nationality around the world. Uh, and temperatures are rising in Brazil, including Bolsonaro and it turns out his wife, uh, since he contracted the disease a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this week, a group of unions, social organizations and medical professionals calling themselves Uni Saúde Network, uh, the United Health Network, called on the International Criminal Court in The Hague to indict the president owing to his contempt, neglect, and denial, which they say amounts to a crime against humanity. So in spite of Bolsonaro's potentially criminal negligence, 
the health system has held on by its fingernails, uh, but I don't know if it can hold on much longer, depending on how this surge goes. Uh, there is a chronic shortage of basic equipment and personnel. Um, and a third, according to colleagues that I speak to in the health system, something like a third of the, the health professionals are already out of commission because they're either ill or they're looking after their kids in the absence of having uh, health support for, their, for, for, for managing their families. So that's crisis number one. Crisis number two, which I won't go into great detail on, is economic crisis. So the impacts of the pandemic are going to be severe, and Andres will kind of walk us through that, I hope. Um, the government's estimating about a 4.7 contraction uh, in economic growth. This is revised down from what it thought would be a zero uh, contraction in March. Uh, but Fitch, the rating agency, is a lot less optimistic. It predicts a drop of about 6% or more. Um, either way, the country is en route to the steepest drop in GDP probably since uh, the 1990s, if not um, well before. Now, Brazil's economy was already suffering before COVID-19. The country only emerged from a six-year recession in 2018. And we saw huge outflows of foreign reserve uh, you know, exchange in 2019 and a significant depreciation of the real, which I'm uh, noticing uh, very acutely these days. Um, even so, the government, and particularly the, its Chicago school-trained finance minister, Paulo Guedes, is very bullish about 2021. He's predicting, as you might expect, a V-shaped recovery uh, and possibly a rebound of about 3.2% by next year. I think most outsiders uh, have their doubts. Uh, and he's been, a lot, he's been adopting pretty Keynesian measures uh, during this, this crisis, cash transfers and subsidies and tax deferrals, uh, and he's chomping at the bit to impose austerity as soon as possible. But we're facing a, a devastating economic crisis, uh, which is hitting people, especially the poorest, hard. And then there's a third crisis, and I'm gonna conclude in this one. As you might expect, Bolsonaro's uh, popular support has taken a bit of a hit with COVID-19 and this economic crisis. Uh, over the last couple of months, he's lost his corruption-fighting uh, justice minister, Sergio Moro, uh, who is at one point one of the most wildly popular politicians in the country. Former allies have turned against him. Uh, support from some of the middle class has, has fallen a bit. Uh, and calls for his resignation and impeachment are growing. Today, he faces uh, something like 48 separate charges of impeachment. Uh, and as of last month, about 55% of Brazilians said they'd like to see him removed before the elections in November 20, uh, 2022. Um, but this is a politician who's pretty cunning and savvy, and he's got three decades of experience in politics. Uh, this is a street fighting politician, and he's not going down uh, without a fight. He's deeply aware his numbers are dropping. And right now he's rallying his congressional base, where he purportedly uh, commands support of about 40% of. Uh, and he's doling out government positions like candy. Uh, the president, he already won over the military establishment the same way. There are more than 3,000 army personnel nominated by this government to positions, more than, by the way, uh, were nominated during the dictatorship. But most importantly here, and this is going to sound very familiar to the people listening, Bolsonaro is still supported by a really hardcore support of loyalists that represent about a third, maybe 30% of the population, and many of them are armed. Uh, the president also has very steady support from the state police who have rallied around him over the last couple of years. And he's laid off his bombast, a bit like uh, Donald Trump has tried to uh, himself in the United States. Uh, his $110 a month emergency subsidy, which is what was given uh, to people who are in need, earned him very high marks in the North and Northeast and Center West of the country, uh, which have traditionally been more supportive of the left. Uh, but these are people who are more dependent on assistance. Uh, so his political future is far from guaranteed. There are huge existential threats he faces, not just from the COVID-19 crisis, but from opposing politicians, the Supreme Court, and even the criminal justice system. So in addition to the threat of impeachment, Bolsonaro could be convicted by the Supreme Court for common crimes or ejected by the National Electoral Tribunal for alleged misconduct during the 2018 campaign. And his three sons, all of whom are also politicians, also face a dizzying array of criminal investigations from everything from money laundering to, to hate crimes. So the president and his family know that the noose is tightening around him and most, most importantly, his, his eldest offspring, Flavio, uh, who's being investigated by the federal police. And meanwhile, f opposition politicians are preparing to file charges accusing him of endangering the public with COVID-19 uh, and everything else. So how does all this end? Well, the good news is we've got Andres here who's gonna give us uh, some, some, some good sense of, of where things are gonna go. But no matter how you look at things, storm clouds are gathering on Brazil's near uh, horizon. The health and economic crisis show no sign uh, of really abating. Indicators of social unrest, um, demonstrations and protests, and even outright violence appear to be climbing. 
Uh, what's more, homicide rates, Brazil's infamously high homicide rates are starting to creep up again. And this is in a country with 60,000 murders a year, by far the most murders in the world. Uh, police killings are also reaching uh, record highs. And this is in a country with 6,000, uh, up to almost 6,000 police executions a year, six times the number in the United States. So I think we can see more heavy handed repression on the horizon. I don't want to end my session on a note of doom and gloom. I've been very depressing, I'm sorry, to date. Um, but I do want to say that we are seeing the emergence of a new coalition of younger leaders, of activists, of professionals demanding a new social contract. I mean, there are signs of resistance in this extraordinarily polarized, extraordinarily rich society, especially coming now at subnational levels of government, from the governors and the mayors. And we're seeing a new crop of candidates finally coming up the ranks that may upset this country's sclerotic political class, although one has to always uh, not hold one's breath too long. Uh, and so while the election is years away, uh, Bolsonaro is still the candidate to beat in 2022. Uh, he's uh, even the once wildly popular President Lula of the PT party, uh, the candidate Fernando Haddad also uh, from the PT party, Ciro Gomez, João Doria, Luciano Hook, or even Sergio Moro. Uh, he's still ahead of all of these guys. Now, they haven't, none of them have formally declared uh, their candidacies and that we can expect the situation to change. But the fact that Bolsonaro is still uh, highest in the rankings, in spite of, of this chaos, is an extraordinary testament to his hold. Uh, to paraphrase the two-time Prime Minister of the UK, Harold Wilson, two years is an eternity in politics. So with that, I'm going to hand over to you, Andres, to take us into the future. Thank you very much, Rob, and thank you very much, Walter, and, uh, and thank you, everyone, for being there. Uh, okay, uh, do, it seems like Doomsday is approaching. However, my only piece of advice is, as a good friend of mine here says, Brazil is kind of easy to predict because always, 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 if you bet on the worst case scenario, you're always going to be because it's addicted to bad governments. Uh, and to an extent, that is true. Uh, but it also depends on your definition of the worst case scenario. So that's where we are now. Uh, Brazil yesterday had a very bad day. Uh, over 1,500 deaths. Uh, and I think it was something like uh, 69,000 cases in one day. Uh, it was the worst day so far on record since, as Rob was saying, the, the pandemic first arrived here in late, in late February. Uh, but as Rob was describing, Brazil is a very big country, continental in size. So it's very hard to see. It's not homogeneous. Questions of climate, demographics, and so on and so forth. For example, the Amazon, the north of the country, was very, very, very badly hit at the beginning of the pandemic, particularly in April. Uh, and now, that's getting slightly better. While the South, which uh, is more developed and whiter, uh, now is doing very badly. Um, so in, in some places, I've been talking to a, a lot of scientists in the past two weeks. Uh, some of the feelings is in, in some of the bigger urban centers like Sao Paulo and Rio, uh, the pandemic had already peaked. But that doesn't mean that it has peaked in the country. And as you can see in the curve, uh, it's quite far from flattening. Uh, so we're still going to hit probably the peak of the pandemic nationwide around mid to late August. This with a, let me put it this way, a quite laissez-faire approach from the president. You need to think Brazil, much like the US, is a federal country. And the Supreme Court, when Bolsonaro started to sort of like downplaying the importance of the pandemic from the very beginning, calling it a sniffle or a little flu, that the Supreme Court said actually it's the states and the cities who have the authority over what to declare lockdowns, to buy medical equipment, to increase uh, hospital capacity, and so on and so forth. And most of them have done, which created uh, part of this constitutional crisis that Rob was mentioning. A, a clash with, with, with the president who was coming sometimes on horseback in the main square in Brasilia uh, to slam the Supreme Court or Congress for attacking him uh, in his quest to change this country uh, into turn it into, let's be honest, for what he seems is the new Jerusalem, which is the US today's 
US. That's kind of his goal. Um, Trump is truly his political soulmate, and we will have to see what happens if Joe Biden wins the election in November. One thing is to be, let's put it this way, one thing is to be the second loudest bark in the park, but a completely different one is when you're not a rich country and you have the loudest bark in the park. What is going to happen to Bolsonaro? But that's another question, Charlie. But the situation is, yes, we have three parallel crises uh, and the environmental crisis. We, 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 I think we need to touch upon that because it's part of this whole ecosystem of drama we are seeing now. However, what I will see is do not, maybe unlike Trump that is looking, especially with the US data today on the economy, although for three months in, in, in US politics, it's an eternity. Uh, we still have to see how Biden performs in debates, but I wouldn't write off Jair Bolsonaro now. Actually, he's looking very, very, very safe. And my own analysis of, and actually I wrote this about early this month, uh, that he indeed realized that he could make a political gamble on the pandemic, despite the 2.6 million infections, the 90,000 deaths, uh, that we have now. And it's, I would say that at least this year, there's a very strong chance that this, he's going to come out stronger politically for a couple of reasons. One is the economic, one is the fact that he got infected, allegedly, because we will never. Allegedly. Mm -hmm. And he came out on television several times and said, Look, I'm fine. My, my athletic physique helped me. Overcoming, you see, this was just a little flu. With hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, you can be cured. Everything is okay. Hmm. He got his latest test results on Saturday. He said he was negative. He was on the road again today, on horseback in the north of the country, uh, rubbing shoulders with supporters and so on and so forth. And he has been doing all along the pandemic to the point that a judge had to come and tell him, you need to wear a mask. Otherwise, you get indicted. So, but it's, again, much like in the US, it's a political strategy, but it seems to be panning out. Yes, as Rob was saying, his approval ratings have taken a beating over the past four months. Uh, the lowest point was roughly 28% about a month ago. However, in the past two weeks, they inch forward, now at 32%. And what's happening, and Rob pointed this out, is the middle class, that it was his staunch supporters. You have to think that Brazil, despite all its poverty, it's a middle income country. And this Brazilian middle class, mainly urban middle class, was the one that got fed up with all the corruption that Rob was um, discussing before. And they saw some of people, because Brazil in a way, despite all the flair about the Bossa Nova and the Carnival and the, and the slim bikinis and the Speedos, is a very conservative country. And it's getting increasingly conservative because of a change in religion, moving from Catholicism to very strong, let's say, radical evangelism. Roughly 70 million Brazilians today are hard right evangelicals. From a broader rate of churches, most of them Brazilian, they're expanding worldwide, especially in Africa and Asia. Uh, and that's part of his power base. But because of what happened with the pandemic, because not only his botched response from, from the central government, but also for his permanently dismissive attitude, but he started to lose that middle class that some of them thought, okay, I don't like this guy. He's a big mouth slamming gays and blacks and, 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 and he just wants to go out and shoot everyone, which is what he said in the campaign. But okay, at least he's not corrupt by, like the left was. So they brought him in. But now he's losing that. And what's happening, he realized that what the left was doing actually works politically. So using, despite, I'm gonna get into the economy man now, but despite Brazil fiscal crisis, uh, which is quite steep. He took advantage of the stimulus package of roughly uh, $250 billion. Uh, the government has been rolling out, it's not, not all, all its new money, but all of this stimulus package, a big part of that is cash transfers 
to the poor and the informal workers. You have to think that Brazil has roughly 210 million people and 40 million, almost 40 million informal workers. So they rolled out first what they call the Corona voucher, which was a small cash transfer scheme to some of these informal workers and the, and, and the most impoverished families. And now they realize, oh, hang on a second, what President Lula has done, which was essentially doing a nationwide system called Bolsa Familia, of essentially a monthly cash transfer, they're boosting it. They're changing its name because otherwise it would be too associated with the left he despises. Changing its name called Renda Brasil, which is Brazil salary or Brazil rent. And they're actually making it bigger and to last at least until the end of the year. The political strategy of that, they realize that the votes from the middle class because of the pandemic have swapped onto the poorer classes. That is currently sustaining, not only, not only underpinning, but also making his popularity two inch upwards. That's one element. Historically, and here it comes the historic background on pandemics in Brazil. Not only the Spanish flu in 1919 killed Brazil's president elect, but also, coincidentally or not, it's very hard to measure the things. Uh, but right after the cholera pandemic, or the cholera epidemic in 1991, uh, President Fernando Colón de Mello was impeached six straight months later right in the midst of the Zika epidemic in 2016, Dilma Rousseff was impeached. Most likely he's not gonna suffer that fate because those two presidents, impeachment proceedings started when they had a 10% approval rating. Bolsonaro is still at roughly 30, so now it's at 32. Let's say he will swing between 28, 35, 25, but as long as he doesn't go below his strong power, radical rates of 15%, he's gonna be safe. That's variable number one. Variable number two, there's something crucial that Rob was mentioning. Brazil is this presidentialism, yes, but it's a hybrid. It's a very Francophile and pro-American country in a way, so the parliament has a lot of power. But in order to get parliament on your side, you need to dole money and you need to lower procedures. He got elected, Bolsonaro, on the promises done with the old politics, no more horse trading, no more pork barreling. I am the new face, the non-corruption, the clean, the messiah, which is actually his second name, his middle name. Well, well, but he realized he cannot govern like that and he cannot save his own buttocks by doing that. And in the past two months, he's been buying off a very powerful center-right coalition called the Centro, or the center, the big center. And a lot of those people have charges, indictments, some of them have been jailed, some of them have been involved in various corruption scandals. And essentially, most of them are there for a price. Uh, but he managed to secure their support, and that is key, to the point that Bolsonaro had lost two health ministers through the campaign. In, in less than four weeks, he lost two. The current one, who is a general, no health experience whatsoever, no health background whatsoever, but he's in an interim position because what we all feel is like he's waiting for one of these powerful centrist congressmen to say, I want that job in order for the full support. And then that's how politics has been handled historically. I mean, in Brazil, he's no different despite all his claims. So that's the second thing. Roughly having roughly a quarter or a third of Congress is a lot in this case. And for all the roughly 40 impeachment uh, requests that they are sitting in the, on the desk of the Speaker of the Lower House of Congress, who is against Bolsonaro, by the way, by the way, um, no impeachment proceeding at this point in time will actually be pushed through because it's not gonna succeed. Mm -hmm. So he's gonna be safe on the parliamentary side and on the, let's call it, popular street side. Number three, Rob mentioned a string of indictments. Yes. Glitch is, in order for any of those indictments to be pushed through by the Supreme Court, let's say the Supreme Court said, Mr. Bolsonaro, you are indictment on X, Y, and Z, which could be meddling with police work to save one of his sons, allegedly, and so on and so forth. Congress needs to vote for the Supreme Court to actually 
run through the trial. Sheet. I will put him 180 days aside and then we'll investigate and then we'll see if you're guilty or not. That's not going to happen because of what I, what, I, what, what I was just saying. So Congress is going to block that. So again, my bet is like for now, don't write him off. And in fact, we go back to the point about getting him getting infected and now being back in the game. He, as the populists are in general, he's excellent at deflecting blame. And he's going to say, yes, we're going, to, we're going through a tragic economic crisis. It's not my fault because the Supreme Court banned me from making key decisions regarding the pandemic. So your governor was the one who imposed the lockdown. So he was the one who starved you to death. He was or she were the ones who actually made you lose your job. Today we have 13 million unemployed people, which is actually is not that bad from where we were coming. We had 11 million before the pandemic. Um, but he can actually deflect brain from the economic crisis completely. You have to think that Brazil was in very bad shape economically and financially before the epidemic. Brazil, during Dilma Rousseff, when the price of commodities tanked in 2014, 2015 and 2016, Brazil, the economy contracted over 7%. That was the worst recession in the country's history. The World Bank now, only two weeks ago, forecast that Brazil the economy will shrink about 8% this year. That's the, that's the doomsday scenario. Yesterday morning, surprisingly to me, Bank of America said, well, it's gonna be bad, but we may have like 5.4% a 5 .4 contraction. Either way, it's gonna be bad. Uh, a lot will hang on how China rolls out its own stimulus. Brazil's still a highly dependent despite being a closed economy, it's highly depending on exporting commodities, mainly soya beans, beef, and uh, iron ore to China. And if you actually do a little round on the Bloomberg terminal, Yahoo Finance, of the big companies that export that to China, Vale for iron ore, JBS for beef, ADM for soya, you will see that their share price has been steadily going up. Uh, so, but what we are going to have, and we go back to the point about how Bolsonaro is going to end up in his popularity through these cash transfer schemes, is that probably Brazil will hit a budget deficit of 15, 14 and 18 percent of GDP. That's a lot. To give you a comparison, although the numbers are really, really blurry there, but Venezuela's budget deficit for this year is forecast at 22 percent. So Brazil is not very far off, and we all know what's going on in Venezuela, what's happening going on in Venezuela for you. So as Rob was saying, the bet from the finance minister, the, the University of Chicago, you can hear the discipline of Milton Friedman with all, he's now a Keynesian as he told me a couple of weeks yep. ago, because we all are, uh, but at some point he will want to tighten the screws and that will be a little stress for Bolsonaro's uh, Gamble. That's one of the big question marks. I think politically he's going to be stronger, but what happens is pushing through stimulus and stimulus and stimulus and running out money. The finance minister says, you know what, I can't go really against my belief on this. Maybe on others, yes, but not on this. And then he slams the door, currency tanks, markets, markets tank, uh, and then the doomsday economic scenario can, can back to the fore. Uh, all, of the, all of this is not good for Brazilian society uh, in general. I think one of the points Rob was mentioning is crucial, which is about the silent racism in this country. Uh, I was talking to Fio, Fio Cruz, it's, it's, it's the most respected health institution. It's actually the one uh, that actually partnered with AstraZeneca and the Oxford University to tell they're doing the vaccine test here and in South Africa. Uh, and so far it seems to be one of the most promising vaccines. Uh, but one of the research, and I have it right here, if I can show the screen for a second, for something that I wrote when there was an echo of the Black Lives Matter um, uh, protest down here in Brazil. And it's quite striking because you will see that, and this was in June, I don't know if I can move this now, Anyway, it says of like five, 50, here, 55% of those who have died of COVID in Brazil 
are black compared to 38% of whites. Brazil is a country, Brazil is the largest African country outside of Nigeria. 56% of Brazil's 210 million inhabitants identify themselves as black. They may not be fully black, but in a way they feel that if they are sought a smaller iota of, of, of African heritage in the blood, they, they consider themselves black. That's a lot. But Rob was mentioning killings by police officers and killings of police officers overwhelmingly black. Uh, detail, there are only two black CEOs in about 2.4 million Brazilian registered companies. Uh, so all of that is panning out in the COVID pandemic. But again, Bolsonaro has resorted to populism through crash transfers to actually lure them in, which he didn't have only two years ago. But this is a cauldron. Brazil is a permanent cauldron. I think what, something that Rob was mentioning is something that we need to keep an eye on. Bolsonaro may be able to serve this year relatively as Catholic and probably stronger politically. But we are going to start entering elections here in October, at the end of October 2022. So Bolsonaro is going to go into full pelt into electoral mode next year and with no money. And the moment that he has shown this, he has been, this has been his modus operandi forever. He's always been, since leaving the army in the early 1990s and becoming a congressman, he's always been a backbencher. And what is usually the role of backbenchers? You need to make noise. You need to make headlines. You need to be heard. He hasn't changed. It's the same thing now. And usually the more corner he feels, which is what happened in April and May, when, as Rob was saying, his popular uh, justice minister resigned, when all these potential indictments started to, to, to sort of like crop up, he started barking really, really loud at Congress and the Supreme Court. And this is what I feel for next year. So don't write him off now. He's there. We may see some economic reforms passing, not, not, nothing major, just to tick some boxes. But next year, we are going to see a lot of fight in the streets. Mm. I don't know if you remember at the end of last year, starting in October, it all started in Ecuador with a very badly timed, and this is Latin America 101, you don't lift fuel subsidized that had been in place for 40 years overnight, that spurred riots in Quito that then metastasized into Chile, which is, has been sort of like, there was always this legend about the Chilean exceptionalism in Latin America that obviously wasn't true. Uh, we also had protests in Bolivia for a different reason, because Evo Morales was trying to steal the election, but still. Uh, and we, we had strong protests in Colombia as well. We didn't have the protest, and in Argentina, we didn't have the protest in Mexico and in Brazil. Why? Because in a way, voting for Bolsonaro here and voting for Andrés Manuel López Obrador in Mexico were the protest vote until what people thought it was the system that failed them. Well, that's gone now. Both Mexico and Brazil have been having a botched response to this pandemic. So, and although Mexico is a bit, although the Mexican president tends to be a little bit more of an emperor in the sense of controlling more institutions than the Brazilians, but I wouldn't discard that as the, as the fog of the pandemic lifts across Latin America, we are going to see a resurgence of popular unrest, probably starting with Chile. And at some point next year, that is going to echo in Brazil. Because killings of black people are not going to stop. Inequality is actually going to get worse. And these cash transfer schemes will only work so far. So again, I think stay tuned because a lot will hang on the death toll. As Rob was saying, this is a country, this is something that sometimes shocked me. This, Brazil could be very callous when it comes to death. So we have an average of 60,000 killings, violent killings every year. It's like, okay, well, it's what happens, you know. It doesn't affect me personally, so why would I care? In a way, this pandemic has affected a lot of people from the elite and the middle class, but that has moved onto the poorer classes. And it's sort of like dripping. Okay, yeah, you don't really see them. Yeah, it's on the news, but, but what's my big question here, and this is my big question mark for the year, what is the tolerance threshold? 
for Brazilians in terms of debt. And how much can that 30, 32% and these cash transfers can sustain this callousness versus, well, I mean, we're probably going to surpass 10,000 deaths at the end of this week. Mm -hmm. uh, again, without being to leave you with the doomsday scenario, but uh, keep in mind that Latin America has suffered a lot of, of, of COVID. It's not just Brazil. I mean, Brazil in Brazil, as Rob knows, everything is big, so everything has to be big. And in a way, to be fair, if you check on the Johns Hopkins uh, tracker, you will see that death per capita in Brazil are lower than in, I think it's right now it's number 14. Uh, it's not an excuse, I said that. But I was actually speaking to one of the two health ministers who resigned two days ago. He said, we could have saved at least half of the life we lost if we could have taken a proper responsible stance from the very beginning and not promoting hydroxychloroquine as this magic pill that would let people go out to the streets, go back to the offices, and life goes on. And on that high note, uh, we'll open the floor for questions. Thank you so very much for just all, all that incredible information. Brazil's certainly been a spotlight in the news lately, and you have helped to enlighten us some. I um, want to invite our members to put their questions in the chat, and I will facilitate asking those questions. Uh, one question that I have for you, Andres, as you were sharing the chart on the COVID deaths is, yeah. can you give us a comparison? Brazil's a large country, but would you please give us some comparisons in terms of population and size with the United States? Like death per capita, you mean? Yes. Well, I mean, it depends on, how, it depends on what you want to measure. So if it's death per 100 people or death of people who tested positive over 100,000 people. Uh, if, it's, if it's the former, it's roughly right now, I'll double check, but it's, it was over 20%. I think it was 28%. If it's the latter, it's roughly 4%. So it's like 4% of people who get infected hmm. uh, die. Which is, about the global average, I mean, global average is about 4.6. Right. Yeah. Yeah. One thing to mention about, I mean, I, everything under is said, of course, I, I agree with. And I but sorry, sorry one, in brackets, but that, yeah. when I go back to Rob, is because Rob's right. Brazil has a quite very well developed public health system. Right. And that has helped. That has been, I would say, the main cushion for this to be a much of a bigger tragedy. It's got something called SUS, which is like a, a universal healthcare system. So 60% of the Brazilian population is covered <clears throat> by universal healthcare. Uh, a lot of people go to private health providers, of course. And what's interesting is that, uh, as I mentioned, 50%, uh, you got a 50% higher survival rate for people who go to private system as opposed to public. So the, the, the public system is holding, but like I said, by its fingernails. One other thing to mention just Deb, before we jump into the questions is, um, you know, Brazil, the reporting of COVID-19 is a question uh, that in spite of a re reasonably good and highly penetrative uh, health system with pretty good capillaries, uh, reporting is still questionable in terms of are we capturing actually the full scope and scale? Like I said, you know, estimates are that maybe 10 to 15 times more people uh, have contracted the infection than, or the virus than, than are, is being reported publicly, number one. Um, and number two, the excess death toll um, that's associated with COVID-19 is expected to be exceedingly high. And what I mean by excess death is the mortality above the natural baseline that you'd otherwise expect to have occurred. So people who die from ancillary causes, for, you know, who are diabetic, who didn't get treatment, who had heart conditions, who, you know, it was aggravated or, um, and so what we're seeing in Brazil are a lot of deaths, uh, you know, mortality and morbidity um, occurring as a result of just not getting access to treatment because of hospitals being filled to capacity. Uh, or otherwise being under capacity. So this is, this is I think we're not going to see the whole sort of impact of this until the tide recedes a little bit, uh, which is probably going to coincide just at that interim moment that Andres is referring to, that medium moment, when we might see the economic crunch um, also happening. Because all of these subsidies that are being paid out are going to have to be, well, not all, are going to have to be, or will be significantly reduced uh, in 2021. So I think we're, 
I, like I said, blinking lights ahead. But I agree with Andres overall that Jair is going to hold on for the, the short term. But let's get to some questions. So just, Maybe we can go there. Just to, just, just to be uh, accurate, can you see my screen now? There it is. Yes. Yeah. So where the purple bit, where it says orbitals confirmed, those are confirmed. But I mean, this is a, a day old. But so 3.6, that's the average. That's what they call the lethality rate. But it's, that's essentially the percentage of people infected over 100,000 people. And then the mortality, which is 42%, is very high. It was 28 about a month ago. Uh, and it's about the number of people who died overall over 100,000 people infected. Got it. Great, thank you. So we have another question on the, um, so there we are. Um, with 40% of the world's forests being destroyed uh, with the deforestation in Brazil, what can the world do? Clearly that's gonna have a global impact, uh, but, but what can we do about that? Hmm. Do, you want, do you want to take on? Take on, sure. I mean, I'll cue. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's 40% of the world's tropical forests, uh, not all of the forests, but it's significant. Um, and I, I think the, the I, I guess it's a couple of things I'd say about this. Um, first of all, Lovejoy, and um, um, uh, who's a, a very well-known um, scientist in the United States, uh, as well as Carlos Nobres, who's a very well-known reputed uh, scientist in Brazil, have done some pretty phenomenal work on estimating what would happen in the event of um, a die-off. So we're getting much better at understanding what the scenario would look like and what, yeah. you know, what the data is. Even though Jair Bolsonaro uh, fired his science minister and has tried to shut down some of the satellite systems and has defunded and deregulated uh, a lot of the institutions responsible for protecting the forest, like agencies like IBAMA and FUNAI, which is a, a group that supports indigenous uh, lands and, and peoples. Um, so I think the first thing that we can do is we can draw attention to, publicize, make aware the kind of science that's out there. And, and a new scientific commission was just set up this year, uh, made up of 100 scientists from across the Amazon, which is seven countries, not just Brazil, uh, who are doing like an IPCC, uh, sort of a, a kind of international uh, climate group uh, focused on the Amazon. And, and so let's give platforms to scientists to, to, to make noise about what's happening, how the urgency of it, and the timeline that we have, which is a, literally a decade. You know, it's what people are talking about before we get to that critical point, number one. Um, so reach out to your groups that are supporting science and start waving the flag. Because what happens in the Amazon doesn't just stay in the Amazon. This is going to have right. impacts on global ocean currents, on, on glacier melts, on, uh, and forget about the Paris Climate Agreements if the Amazon goes. The second point I'd say is um, we have to get a lot smarter about zero deforestation. There's no need right now in the Amazon to have any deforestation. Because what's happening is it's cheaper and easier to go and clear new land than it is to make existing land more viable or retreating it. And so what's happening right now is that um, in spite of a number of moratoriums and legislation that tried to limit deforestation, uh, Jair Bolsonaro in particular has been incentivizing um, uh, you know, his yeah. ranching coalitions and his agro-industry coalitions to go and uh, to, to clear more land. So that's number one. Number two is we should have a zero deforestation mantra. and. We can use the levers of international multilateral trade agreements to apply that kind of pressure. Right now, the European Union and Mercosur, which is the big regional trading bloc, are ne have negotiated an agreement around open free trade. Uh, and there are a set of environmental conditions around that. Um, we need to get a lot tighter about holding the feet, the fire of governments in the region to make sure that they meet those minimum conditions, which include zero deforestation. There's no reason to do it. Number three, you can start working with the agro industries and beef industries uh, that are committed to greening their supply chains. There, there are a lot of groups right now that are feeling the pressure uh, from their shareholders who are uh, getting uh, a lot of heat from their compliance officers who are trying to adhere to ESGs and better KPIs for their environment, social governance uh, uh, investments. So work with the coalitions of the willing uh, who are really serious about, you know, and let's not be naive because a lot of them are just saying they're doing it, they're not doing it but let's get smarter and let's trace those supply chains. Let's get smarter about tracing what's happening uh, and following uh, as it were uh, the commodity, the money back to those groups that are not abiding by the law. And the final thing I have to say is, is frankly leadership um, and financing and support for the local institutions. I mean, Brazil actually had an incredibly successful experience between around 2002 and 2012, I guess it was maybe around that time. 
were basically through a, a, a combination of zero tolerance on deforestation, uh, moratoriums on soy production that led to deforestation, uh, as well as a combination of investments in protection, uh, improved monitoring and surveillance and enforcement of that surveillance, uh, you actually had a radical drop in deforestation uh, between 2002 and 2012. I, I may have the date slightly off, maybe been 2004 and 2012, under Marina Silva, who was then the environment minister who, who ran for president twice uh, and lost. So the good news is, is that Brazil's done it before um, through a combination of just smart policy moves uh, and right kind of pressure. Right now, we have a president who's absolutely not interested in this, whose incentives are not oriented in that direction. Uh, and we're gonna have to get a lot better uh, at trying to apply the pressure globally, which goes back to the first point about waving the flag about the evidence. But Andres, over to you. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And I think there's something else which I just put that up on the screen, this happened like, this was a letter that we reported on about two or three weeks ago. In, in very interestingly, because I think something, the Amazon was something that made a lot of, the deforestation in the Amazon was something that made a lot of noise last year, especially because there was a big spat between Emmanuel Macron, France's president, and Jair Bolsonaro. Uh, sort of like, there was a lot of your alignment, as Rob was saying, with scientists and so on, but this year, something that started happening, this dry season here is starting in the Amazon. So last year, what happened was, aside from being a lot of deforestation, essentially loggers, ranchers, land grabbers, Gualcat miners, been feeling emboldened by Bolsonaro's sort of like very standoff approach, okay, just go and just wreck the place. Um, then wildfires started. The way it works is people who usually take the trees out, the valuable ones, then they burn out the land, slash and burn, as it's called, to then either sell it for a profit or keep it to cattle ranch or something else. Last year, it was one of the year records in terms of wildfires. I mean, satellite images all over the place and so on and so on. So it created, and it coincided with the G7 meeting. So Macron, which is actually, I don't many people think about it, but it's a neighbor because the French Guiana is right up here. Uh, and it's part of the Amazon. Uh, there was a big spat and that made a lot of noise. The problem with that is, I would say there are three, Plays four things that are Bolsonaro, yeah, yeah, exactly. There are three, four things that Bolsonaro, whatever you do, will never change his mind about. Gays, religion, guns, and nationalism. And for, Brazilian, for a Brazilian military man, the Amazon is the apex of nationalism. Don't mess with the Amazon because that's my... So, what's starting to happen now this year, which is interesting, it's essentially hit them where it hurts, which is that thing that I just put up. The Norwegians, for example, are dumping shares of companies that have been involved, like meat packers, that have been uh, found guilty of essentially uh, slaughtering cattle that was... Uh, but that was grazing on deforested land. Uh, big investors like Mitsui, Sumitomo, BlackRock, I'm saying, guys, uh, if you keep deforesting the Amazon, we're not gonna invest in Brazil anymore. So in a way now, especially at the time of an economic crisis, we are gonna go through a recession. Brazil is gonna need investment. And one of the Bolsonaro's promises was, we are finally gonna open up the economy and become a free market economy and so on and so forth. Well, actually, if you keep messing with the forest, we're not going to put money into Brazil. Uh, and that's, that's hitting them where it hurts. That's something that is actually starting to gain pace, to my surprise, I have to say. Uh, and it could have an effect, at least in some senior government officials like the finance minister who say, you know, guys, mm -hmm. Because also, there was something else that started to change about two or three months ago with all the who about Bolsonaro's budget response to the pandemic. It's like, and I think this is also because they fear Trump may lose. And if Trump may lose, they, they will lose the ally. What's happening to Brazil's image overseas? You have to think that Brazil historically has been quite a successful superpower in terms of soft power, meaning culture and environment. All that went down the drain with Bolsonaro. So now there's been a bit of a campaign of trying to change Brazil's image overseas. And part of that is what to do with the Amazon. So Bolsonaro, you know, his military side, he sent the military to, to fight their, 
the loggers and the wall fighters was not going to work because essentially at the same time he dismantled the proper environmental agency that are have a mandate to enforce environmental laws which in, in this country had been very strict until now uh, so all of that is creating a sense of okay some people in the government is realizing what's going on and is going to be a problem and if you ask me today i would say bolsonaro's achilles heel two years down the road is not going to be the epidemic it's going to be the amazon it's going to be the environment because that could have international repercussions especially if, if trump loses that would brazil would pay his government at some point will will have to pay the price so it's a double-edged sword a lot of international pressure like what happened last year with macron could make him bike louder but at the same time hitting them where it hurts it could actually have the effect of you know what maybe we need to get rid of the environment minister who nobody likes except you mr president that kind of approach. So it may happen. I don't know. But all these signs about investors dumping assets that have anything to do with potential deforestation in the Amazon, I think is a good sign. Interesting. And one thing that has not been addressed is how both the deforestation in the, of the Amazon as well as COVID are an impacting the indigenous populations yes. of Brazil. I was actually, I was actually, this, I was actually in Manaus in the Amazon this past week and doing a story exactly on that. And it's not just because indigenous populations tend to have different levels of immunity than what they call the white people do, but it's also because the response has not been good. And, and I mean, it's complicated. They live very isolated. So the zoo system takes a lot of time to arrive to those villages. And one of the allegations, one of the most recent allegations, is that some of those infections were brought in by some of the health workers. But also the other allegation is, there's a, there's a, a, a symbiotic relationship between the indigenous people and the forest. You kill indigenous people, the forest will die because indigenous people essentially believe of the forest and protect the forest. And vice versa, you kill the forest, you kill the indigenous people. And this in, the deforestation brings in what? Loggers wildcat gold miners, ranchers, and a lot of them have brought in the disease and have infected the indigenous people. Well, again, they live very isolated. It's very hard to, to actually be, it, it could take four or five days for them. Sometimes they, 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 they die on the way to the hospital in some of the big cities in Manaus or in Belém. So it's a big problem. I think it's gonna be one of the big problems, but also it all ties not only to the deforestation and the pandemic, but also federal government policy, or at least ideas. Bolsonaro has always been very clear from the start, even during the campaign, oh, indigenous, have, indigenous people have a lot of land, too much land, and they're not that many. So we need to open the Amazon for commercial development, mining, infrastructure, and so on. And then they will benefit, and there are people like us, they will live like us. Well, actually, I spent time living with them, and it's not like that. So if it also part, it, Rob was mentioning a, a complaint before the International Criminal Court in the Hague by the health workers, but there was another one a couple of weeks ago from indigenous groups also put before the International Criminal Court in the Hague on willing to bring up genocide charges against President Bolsonaro for his handling of the COVID pandemic in indigenous lands. Thank you. I think we are uh, about out of time. Uh, th uh, thank you so much for the informative program today. And we will post the presentation as well as the links that you put in the chat and any other links that you can send us, especially Andres, and the things you, you were sharing. Okay. Yeah. And if you and if any have anyone has any 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 curious, please feel free to email me. I mean, you can you, you can share my email address. No problems. Great. Thank you.